Hello everybody and welcome to the Dry Dock episode 217. This week the questions are taken from guide 259, which is the guide to the SMS Kaiserin und Königin Maria Theresa, Austro-Hungarian if you hadn't figured that one out already, um, and the video from well, the Wednesday of that time on the King George V class, Design, Service and Myths. So let's begin. Augusto Solari asks, did the Japanese address the shortcomings their carrier operations showed at the Battle of Midway in the next battles, or did they just go along like nothing had happened? They tried where they could. I mean, obviously, there was a limited amount of lessons you could learn from thing that had gone up in massive ball of fire, almost everybody had died, and then you'd had to sink it, as opposed to, you know, a damaged ship that got home. But they still did learn lessons. I mean, you know, the US managed to learn lessons from Lexington, even though it also went up in a massive fireball and sank. So the Japanese mainly learned things like, you know, draining the fuel lines so that they weren't quite so incendiary. They also, when you look at the, say, the battles around Guadalcanal, if the Guadalcanal battles had been happening with a midway mindset, then you would have seen a single massive wave of aircraft, basically the entire deck load capability of all the carriers present, sent off into the skies in an overwhelming strike. Now, whilst the Japanese still, you know, did this, did, did, they still had the practice of combining launches from multiple carriers to form a large strike package, which was a very effective and fairly fast way of doing things. When you look at Santa Cruz or Eastern Solomons, you see that, you know, they're launching between a dozen and two dozen aircraft per carrier and then forming up for a large-ish strike, but not the colossal overwhelming one that they sent at, say, Midway Island, or for example. Um, and then you see a follow-up wave. So they're launching, they're using, they're using their already very good you know, rapid launch, combine air groups from multiple carriers tactic, but they're combining that with launching more multiple smaller strikes rather than waiting for one big one, which probably explains in part why they had some of the success that they did at Eastern Solomons and Santa Cruz. Not that obviously it went all of their way, but they were making some changes. Other changes, you know, they unfortunately could not make. Uh, for at least unfortunately for them so for the u.s when they got the lessons of the lexington sinking and later yorktown sinking they could incorporate those into the later essexes and even the ones that were under construction and well along at that point could still to a certain extent be refitted but some of the issues with the japanese carriers obviously shikaku and zuikaku would have required complete refits to address those which they didn't have time for and something like taiho for example was very very nearly done by that point it was substantially complete by late 42 they still obviously had to run commissioning um, and final fit out and so forth which is why it didn't come into service immediately but um, it would have been much much more difficult to rip up Taiho especially being that she was an armored deck carrier and as opposed to uh, you know an Essex that's part way through construction or maybe hasn't even been laid down yet or in the case of the very very most recent um the sort of the most recently completed or near complete so essex for example herself then it was easier to access those systems plus other things like you know we need more damage control equipment we mean need more portable pumps those lessons might have been might have been appreciated in theory but the difference between the theory and the practice of actually getting them and distributing them is another matter and of course some of the more some of the larger problems with the Japanese carriers in terms of their ability to effectively deliver damage was that, you know, things like the Val dive bomber was hilariously fragile and vulnerable by the latter part of 1942. But it took a lot of time for the Japanese to introduce replacements in any large numbers, by which point, you know, the lack of experienced pilots mitigated the impact that a better, more survivable dive bomber had. Brendan Boersdorf asks, do you think it would be, be possible to do a video analysing the anti-aircraft weapons of World War I? It'd be interesting to see that compared to the World War II video, who had the right ideas earlier on? It certainly would be possible 
to do. Um, but it would be a, well, I think it would either be a relatively short video, because if you went by the truly effective World War One anti-aircraft weapons, it, yeah, there's not going to be anywhere near as many of them as there were in World War Two. On the other hand, if I split the video into two sections, either part one and part two, or just into, you know, two parts within a single video, and one part covered you know, the ones that actually worked and one part covered all the various attempts to generate anti-aircraft weapons that shall we say charitably didn't work that could be quite an amusing video and probably go on for a while i mean you can just look at this one in, in the foreground okay there's some room for improvement but there is a certain logic to the aa gun in the foreground as opposed to the walking health and safety violation that is the one in the background, which appears to be more along the lines of having put a field gun on top of a trebuchet carriage. Peter asks, which was better, aluminium or steel windscreens for battleship shells? I ask because I noticed Germany and Italy used aluminium windscreens in World War II, and if you subtract the weight of the of understandably lighter windscreens from the different Navy shell weights, you end up with different numbers that tell a somewhat different story compared to shell weights in total. And of course, the windscreen weight is weight that doesn't matter. Also, supposedly aluminium windscreens help with oblique impact angles because they shatter instead of rotating off on the first impact. So for general reference, the windscreen is the pointy bit at the top of the shell. You can see in this diagram you have on the left, the shell itself. In the middle, the armor-piercing cap that pops on top of the shell. And then the windscreen that usually screws on top of the armor-piercing cap. And then it assembles into the long pointy thing that most people are familiar with. Now the thing is with the windscreens, they have to basically do three things. One, they have to survive the force of acceleration out of the gun without deforming. Two, they have to survive the passage through the air with all the various lateral forces involved in that without deforming. And three, when you hit the target, you want them to basically go away as easily as possible, you know, ideally without damaging or dragging off the AP cap um, or mashing themselves all over it or something like that. Now, as far as I can tell, materially wise... Aluminium should be the superior metal. Now, granted, you're going to have to make it somewhat thicker than steel for the same amount of strength, because although aluminium has a better strength to weight ratio, a very thin walled aluminium windscreen will, you know, quite easily deform or break. And once you make it up past a certain thickness, the aluminium, as you mentioned, will become quite brittle, which will make it easier to knock off, which is good. The downside to it is, of course, as I said, one, it's going to be um, somewhat thicker and aluminium is a lot more expensive to produce than steel. So you're basically coming up with kind of a premium windscreen and being relatively brittle, you may have issues with long term storage of aluminium windscreen shells as opposed to steel ones. On the other hand, it's not going to rust anytime soon, which is pretty good. And as you pointed out, it will obviously be a lighter windscreen than a steel one which means that you can put a little bit more weight into the shell itself for the same overall weight that's going to be kicked out of the gun therefore you know better performance at the other end when you hit something the caveat apart from expense is obviously going to be that you may need to rebalance your shell because if all your previous shell designs are going to be based on steel windscreens then with a lighter weight one up front you're going to say you're going to have to rebalance everything to make sure the shell stays pointing in the correct direction and doesn't go off doing its own thing and i suspect from my engineering background that if you're talking about something that's more likely to snap than to bend there may and i stress may at very high impact velocities be some slightly unwanted effects upon impact. Now, that would require a lot more in-depth research, but instinctually, 
you know, given the way that metals perform if they're brittle up to the point that they break, as opposed to if they're ductile um, before they break, there may be there may be some adverse effects that you may not necessarily want. You know, small amounts of shock, small amounts of yaw, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Of course, once it has broken, um, and therefore you know it, it's gone slightly faster, then yeah, an oblique impact might work a little bit better because a ductile steel windscreen cap, uh, which be bends a little bit more and therefore might have a little bit more yaw input for a little bit longer, might cause it to be cause a shell to deflect just slight a little bit more or not have quite as good effect on very very high angle impacts, i.e., where you know where the shell's dropping in from a very great height at a very steep angle against belt armor or skimming a deck or something like that. So broadly speaking, if you're prepared to go through the expense of making what is essentially a disposable wind cover, um, and ultimately is probably far less important to the overall mechanics of penetration than the AP cap design, for example, then aluminium is probably the better option except for possibly in more direct uh, more perpendicular impacts either more traditional impacts where i th i think maybe it's brittle nature might compromise things a bit um but as i said take that with a small grain of salt because i haven't done a full engineering analysis on you know high speed impact deformation of aluminium versus thin steel juanito alemana asks did the Austro-Hungarian submarines achieve anything of note? Yes, they managed to sink a number of ships, um, destroyers, merchant ships, liners, etc. And four armoured cruisers, which isn't bad going, considering that there weren't that many armoured cruisers present in their area of operations to start with, or at least on the enemy side. And... Um, Quite possibly the single most notable thing that they achieved in terms of the overall impact on the war in the Adriatic was the torpedoing of the Corbet class battleship Jean Bar towards the end of 1914. Because up until that point, admittedly Italy wasn't in the war yet, but up until that point, the French and the British had been patrolling quite close up into the north of the Adriatic using anything up to and including Dreadnought-type battleships, which severely constrained the operational capabilities of the Austro-Hungarian Navy. By torpedoing the Jean Bart, even though she wasn't sunk, everybody got a little bit of cold feet about operating big battleships in very confined waters where there were lots of torpedo-armed stealthy craft around, and Anglo-French battleships retreated well south and once the Italians joined the war they took that lesson on board and their battleships also operated further south which meant that in the northern Adriatic the Austro-Hungarian navy for most of the war possessed a considerably greater freedom of movement than they otherwise would have all thanks to U-12's hit on Jean Bar which is you know a fairly important strategic move. Alexandre José da Costa Neto asks do you ever plan on doing a video about the Battle of Riachuelo between the Paraguayan and Brazilian navies, as it's probably very unknown outside South America, but it played a major part in the result of the Paraguayan War? It is definitely a battle that's on my list to cover. Um, it, it will be a little while before I get to it. My, the schedule is booked up a fair bit. <laughs> yeah. When you talk about my preparation schedule, things are booked up months, if not years, in advance, but no, it, it will come. Um, I do want to cover it, but uh, apart from anything else, because obviously, as you said, it is a battle that is more widely known in South America than than any anywhere else, kind of similar to what I did with the South American Dreadnoughts uh, arms race video, I would want to, once I've created the scripting for it and done all the research, I would want to get it recorded in this particular case in Spanish and Portuguese as well. Um, ideally South American Spanish and South American Portuguese, so that, you know, the people who are most likely to know about the battle and be interested in it can also hear it in their own language. So if you happen to be from South America or have roots there 
and you know retain the ability to speak either Brazilian Portuguese or South American Spanish and you like a, a little job as a narrator dash voice actor I guess for a video like this in sort of some point next year then please do get in touch because that would be great and that's not me as a half Bolivian just being particularly regionalist there are actually distinct differences between uh, Spanish Spanish if you like i.e. Spanish from the European mainland and the Spanish that's spoken in Bolivia, Peru, Ecuador, Chile etc etc and I deeply suspect there are similar differences between Brazilian Portuguese and mainland European Portuguese as well so that's why I'd be looking for that particular dialect. Yu Lu asks since World War One era submarines were mostly used in attacks when surfaced or at periscope depth, taking advantage of their small size and weather or night cover, it seems like the ability to submerge is not as critical to convoy raiding dash disruption duties. Has there been any idea about making torpedo boats, which also attack taking advantage of spotting limits, more ocean going and long range and thus more adept at convoy raiding? Or is that basically reinventing the destroyer? Well, yeah, you would effectively just be making the destroyer at that point. Um, but there are a couple of other issues to take into account. Now, whilst it's true that surfaced submarines using deck guns or submarines at periscope depth firing torpedoes, generally speaking, were the majority of um, attacks made by U-boats in World War One, as opposed to deep firing torpedoes, um, which, to be fair, I mean, even in World War Two, you know, there's not that much deep firing torpedoes going on in most circumstances. But it's not so much the attack in and of itself or what you're doing at that exact moment that makes submarines so deadly as commerce raiders. It's everything leading up to and after that because uh, certainly, in world, at least if we confine ourselves to World War I, for a good chunk of the time, there wasn't really anything you could do to a submarine. You know, it would fire, sink a ship, and then you, if you had an escort, you would turn around and go, uh, the escort would turn around and go, okay, we need to find and kill this thing. Now, up until, until that point, you could argue maybe a torpedo boat style craft could have done a similar sneak attack, but it's a lot easier to spot a torpedo boat that's trying to hightail it out of there than it is a submarine that will have just downed a periscope. So you might have a general idea where that submarine is, but not a specific one. And yeah, until the de invention of depth charges, there's not an awful lot you can do about it. You could charge over there and try and ram, but by the time you get there, the sub's probably dived and wandered off to do something else. So the submarine is a lot more survivable when it comes to escape and evasion after the attack. And the other thing is, you know, in terms of actually getting into that attack position in the first place. Whilst a torpedo boat in the World War I sense, yes, it does rely to a certain extent on stealth to make its attacks. A lot of what the torpedo boat was designed to do either involves operating as part of a fleet, where the other parts of the fleet are a major distraction, or in literal environments where spotting is considerably harder than, say, on the open ocean. And a torpedo boat that's approaching from miles and miles and miles and miles away on the surface using either steam power or maybe diesel, probably, probably steam to be honest, will almost certainly be spotted during its approach, if for no other reason than people will see a plume of smoke on the horizon. And a torpedo boat is not particularly durable if there are escorts that are going to shoot back. Submarines, on the other hand, because they're travelling underwater on batteries when they're making their close approaches, aren't usually spotted. And you know, that's why they have hydrophones and later on after the World War One sonar. But it's much, much, much harder to spot a submarine making its approach if you spot it at all. So that, again, makes both the attack more surprising and it makes the sub much, much more survivable. Whereas you know, a purely surface bound radar is much, especially if it's a small one, is much, much easier to spot coming in. And even if you don't do that, it's much easier to spot trying to escape and then kill. Alex asks, I heard the HMS Warspite when doing shore bombardment of Normandy during the D-Day landings was able to successfully jam the radar of the German guns. Was this common during World War II? From a naval perspective, 
once you get to the mid part of the war, so 42, 43, it's actually surprisingly more common than you'd think for a few reasons. Now, when you hear about radar jamming in World War II, quite a lot of the time that's associated with the air campaign. And one of the reasons you'll sometimes read for the RAF not deploying radar jammers in its bomber raids over Germany is that they were worried that the Germans would then do the same in their raids over the UK. And radar was vastly, vastly more important to UK air defences because of the relatively small size of the country than it was to German air defences, where it was still very useful, but ultimately Germany well, and occupied Europe at that point, is of such a size that a decent system of uh, coast watchers and inland watchers could probably give enough warning to get fighters airborne, at least for some of the heartland targets that the RF might go after. Now, while there may be an element of truth to that, and they ended up deploying uh, chaff and so forth uh, instead, there's also the fact that... Radar jammers for the larger, more powerful radars are fairly heavy, power-intensive things. Um, not to say you couldn't get one on an aircraft, but it would be um, a compromise. Whereas the same size jammer on a ship, you know, an aircraft that weighs a few tons or a few, maybe a, a double-digit tons, as compared to a ship that weighs five or five digit tons you know or even in the case of destroyers which didn't tend to carry jammers too often but they're still four digit tons um now you know therefore a, a ship can carry jammers a lot more easily than an aircraft is what i'm getting at there and yes so you know people very quickly appreciated if radar is a thing then radar jamming is a thing and we want the radar to be jammed for the enemy and not for us, which, you know, given that everyone worked at different frequencies, was quite handy as well. So even as early as, you know, 1942, you see ships either being fitted with on launch or refitted with when they come into dock, various radar jammers. Now, of course, there, as I said, there are multiple different types of radar. So there's shore-based radar, there's ship-based radar, there's ship-based air search, uh, surface search, gunnery control, air control, etc. And, you know, multi-spectrum frequency hopping jammers, as people have these days, weren't really so much of a thing back then. Um, so you did have to choose what, what you were going to try and jam within reason. So, you know, ships would, might carry four, five, six different types of radar, but if you're going to add four, five, six different types of jammer as well, that could make things problematic. And you, you could dial the frequency of some of the better jamming equipment anyway within certain parameters. So um, you then have the contest, of course, of power supplies because, you know, jamming that's powered by you know, two AA batteries or something versus a radar that's being operated but plugged straight into a power station, well, that jamming's probably not going to do all that much. But when the power supplies are a little bit more equal, then and the outputs, etc., are better aligned, then you're going to get better results. So, yeah, radar jamming navally as a whole, from, I would, I would probably say, solidly 43 onwards, is definitely a lot more common than you might otherwise think, although the sheer multiplicity of different types of radar and not necessarily wanting to force your opponent into developing brand new radars by constantly putting them under that tended to mitigate its use to a little bit less than you might otherwise think once you're aware of how widespread the technology was but for something like you know the shore bombardment of normandy where the ships are in relatively speaking static positions and moving relatively slowly that's definitely sometime a point where you pull out all the stops when it comes to jamming 96831 asks how many 40 millimeter pom-poms 40 millimeter bofors and 20 millimeter orlicans could Prince of Wales have gotten had she not been sunk? So we can get a rough guide on this kind of thing based on what King George V, Duke of York, Anson and Howe received as far as their anti-aircraft refits over the course of the war. But it would only be a rough guide because, of course, they all ended up with slightly different AA fits. But broadly speaking, if you kind of average everything out... 
then what if Prince of Wales had survived her encounter with the Japanese Navy in late 41, what you would have expected to see would have been in sort of late 42, early 43, maybe if she's operating the forest, maybe a little bit earlier, about two to three dozen 20 millimeter orlicans being added then in late 43 early 44 you would see um a couple of quad 40 millimeter bofors added three or four mounts of pom-poms added a mixture of quadruple and octuple mountings which means yes you have two different 40 millimeter caliber weapons there but the british were able to produce pom-poms locally in significantly large numbers and you know they had some advantages in certain circumstances and then you would have seen some additional orlicans added um by this point probably more twins than singles and you may have seen some of the singles removed in in favor of putting twins in their place and then in sort of 45 ish um, you would have seen maybe a few more single 20 millimeters go by the board and more pom-poms still be added and then assuming she survives through into the post-war environment you'd pretty much see all the orlicans go and a mixture of even more pom-poms and uh, the occasional bofors being stuck in their place for the post-war period and so that that's kind of your rough guide to what her AA fit would have been but her late war AA fit would have you know, included anything in the region of between 40 to 80 40 millimeter barrels, depending on exactly what kind of pom pom and bofors mount she had, and probably about the same in orlicans, mostly in twin mounts, but with the occasional single. Spintanium asks, I loved your reading of The Thunder Child. Have you considered narrating the rest of the War of the Worlds? I'd happily back a Kickstarter for such a project. Well, I greatly enjoyed doing that narration. Um, and as you can see, I actually went the whole hog and got a full 3D model commissioned of HMS Thunderchild. Look at my precious baby. It's actually genuinely one of the things I've absolutely most enjoyed about doing this channel is getting to see this come into the closest thing to real life until I can get off my backside and get my 3d printer fired up it is it's a it is a thing of beauty if i do say so myself now all credit by the way to ec henry absolutely wonderful 3d artist who some of you might know from youtube who i commissioned to make the model uh, because yeah i don't have this three degree of 3d modeling skill anyway getting back to war of the worlds you know if i did that i mean it would take a fair bit of time um, I mean, War of the Worlds isn't the longest book, but, you know, it is, it's quite a few hours of audio recording and presumably editing as well. So if I was going to try and do that to you know, a standard professional enough to be popped into a, an audio book of some description, I mean, I don't think I'd necessarily need a Kickstarter to do that. I would more just need a uh, a bit of a push from people saying, yes, we actually want to hear this. Um because if I'm going to put that amount of time in, I do want people to, you know, actually, you know, maybe listen. Um, but, you know, it, it depends also on what people want. Because fortunately, the book War of the Worlds is now in the public domain. So there's nothing to stop me just picking it up and reading it from it and, you know, doing a full audiobook version, I guess. But if people wanted it to, say, be not just be a digital release of some description, but maybe also be... Because I, obviously I can record it as an MP3 or whatever, but if you wanted it formatted into full audiobook format with chapters and everything, and maybe bundled with Thunderchild posters or even you know 3D print models or something like that, then at that point the amount of money involved would probably justify a Kickstarter or something of that nature. Um, but yeah. Let's, let's see in the comments below if people if there's any significant swell of people who'd actually want that in the first place and maybe we can go from there afterwards dr comic asks what's your opinion on arc royal's career well it depends which arc royal you mean because within the scope of 
well, within the main scope of the channel, there are three Ark Royals. There's the World War One Ark Royal, there's this one, the World War Two Ark Royal, and then there's the Audacious class that just scrapes in at the end. And within the overall scope of the channel, there's all the various Ark Royals that precede that as well, all the way down to the Ark Royal that faced off against the Spanish Armada. But I'm going to assume for the moment that you mean the Ark Royal of World War Two. And in that case, I would say her career was tragically cut short. She actually did a, a lot of good work in the time that she was in service in World War II. She was off of Norway, she was off of the French coast, she was operating as part of Force H. Um, you know, she was an incredibly active vessel, obviously taking part as well in the hunt for and sinking of Bismarck. But the reason why I say it was tragically cut short, apart from the fact that obviously she was, you know, torpedoed and then sank in relatively early in the war, You've also got to bear in mind that when you look at her air group, although it's maybe not quite as impressive as Yorktown glasses or whatever in the early part of the war, you've also got to remember that the fleet air arm was very heavily stretched in the early part of the war. So Ark Royal was able to carry more aircraft than most other carriers. And on top of that, um, she wasn't running at full capacity a lot of the time in the early part of World War II because there just weren't that many aircraft available. She was a big carrier. She had a lot of aircraft carrying capacity um, and could have been put to an awful lot of use. Now, of course, she didn't have an armoured flight deck the same way that the illustrious class did, so um, probably not the best idea to sort of, if, assuming she'd survived, put her into the full Mediterranean combat conflict. The Force H was probably about the closest you wanted to put her for that. But with the fact that she was sunk before really the FAA began to get slightly more modern aircraft and aircraft in much larger numbers available, you know, in the later convoys, pedestal, harpoon, vigorous, etc., an Ark Royal that was primarily loaded with sea hurricanes or early sea fires, or even just large amounts of full Mars, could have made a huge amount of difference. And then, you know, heading later on, heading over to the Far East, once deck parking was kind of switched on, she could have carried a huge number of aircraft, at least as far as you know the Royal Navy's operation of carriers was concerned. And having her available period, um, after, in the period after which she was sunk, it might have shaken loose a carrier to help defend for Z. You know, Ark Royal, a surviving Ark Royal sent with Prince of Wales and Repulse, if she'd been loaded up with, you know, early shipments of martlets or something, might actually have legitimately been able to go and, and stand off against the incoming Japanese aircraft, if not completely, then certainly more than enough for the remaining AA guns to sort things out. So yeah, her career was action-packed, but tragically ended far too soon. Adam Merry asks, As mentioned in the King George V video, towards the end, one of the areas of improvement would have been the thickness of turret faces and barbettes. However, I've read somewhere that due to improvements of steel production in the UK, the armour was harder and more likely to shatter shells on impact, therefore improving the effective thickness of the armour. I think a discussion of these concepts would be interesting. Another interesting video would be comparing the secondary guns of World War II battleships, as I've heard numerous times the 5.25-inch guns were good surface weapons but not good anti-aircraft weapons, which contradicts the Japanese reports you mentioned, which states they were effective even when Prince of Wales was crippled. So yeah, I've, I've mentioned that a few times before, but you have two elements primarily to armour, Great, uh, well, armor thickness, armor grade, armor resistance capability. So you have the material qualities of the armor itself. And in that respect, yes, British and German armor in World War II are the newly manufactured stuff. So the stuff you'd find on King George V and Bismarck, as opposed to the stuff you might find on Queen Elizabeth or something. Um, they had made material advances, including various trace elements into their mix, including things like molybdenum, and that did make for a materially better steel than American, Japanese, Italian, etc., etc. So, it, you know, just on paper, in terms of its physical properties, it was better at resisting incoming fire. Uh, now, that's one part of it. 
and the other part of it is the depth of the face hardening and in that respect the British were on to a good thing because the British along with the Italians uh, and one or two others had a good balance between the depth of the face hardening for battleship scale armour and how deep the softer more ductile back should be. Uh, with American armour the class A face hardened stuff they actually tended to slightly over egg it on the face hardening which was really good at cruiser levels but not so good at battleship levels um, the British were the other way around their stuff was much better at battleship levels but perhaps slightly worse in that aspect in cruiser levels and the Italians kind of swept the board in that particular aspect because they were basically varying the face hardening depth on their various armors whether they were cruiser or battleship but they didn't have the material quality um, in terms of you know alloys and trace elements and so forth so when it comes to something like massive thick armor slabs like you'd find on turret faces on a king Tour's fifth class battleship that is probably where you're going to probably find the single best resistance face hardened armor of the war because it's got the right level of face hardening thickness and a very very good quality of steel with mixed in with all these various trace elements and so yeah th there is a certain amount of adjustment you probably have to do if you're taking um you know an, a, a standard thickness comparison and a, therefore a modifier that says well actually this face plate is equivalent to probably something that's two or three inches thicker if it we were looking at anybody else's uh, armor plate with the exception of, uh, possibly of the germans but you know working out exactly what your modifying factors would be that would actually be a very interesting video to do um but it would require an awful lot of crunching down and of course because you'd be saying well this nation's armor is better than that nation's armor in this aspect and this nation's armor is better than this other nation's armor in that aspect you're of course going to annoy an awful lot of people which means an awful lot of tables and formulas etc et are going to have to be drawn up to show exactly why these things are being made um, with the 5.25s again this is something um, i've talked about previously yes the 5.25 is a better surface weapon than it is an anti-aircraft weapon for the majority of the war uh, towards the end of the war once they've worked out some of the issues with the the twin turret itself and you have long-range radar directed fire control it becomes a lot lot better um, but the 5.25 is not a bad anti-aircraft weapon um, where sometimes lines get crossed is that the five inch 38 is a exceptionally good anti-aircraft weapon for world war ii and compared to that the 5.25 is not as good as the five inch 38 but nothing is and as i just said the 5.25 did have its faults as well if you were an aviator in World War II, there are certainly a number of other heavy anti-aircraft or dual-purpose guns that you'd probably much rather be pointed your way than a 5.25, but there's one or two that you would even less want to be pointed at you, like the 4.5 or the 5-inch 38. MSSB asks, was there ever a plan for the 5.25-inch to be mounted on a destroyer, like an enlarged tribal, or perhaps even a daring with a Mark III autoloading twin turret? or just a C-class variant with four single gun mounts. Believe it or not, yes, there was. Uh, initially, my instinctual response reading the question was, no, I don't remember, but then I thought, I better double check. Um, so I looked through things, and yes, in fact, there was discussion about putting 5.25-inch guns on destroyers. Specifically, actually, this was right at the end of the 1930s, just before the outbreak of World War II, where they'd built the tribals, and then they were moving on to the JKLs, Ms, Ns, etc. And this was around about the time that the designs for the L and M types were being considered. And it had been appreciated that with the tribals that you needed a better dual purpose mounting. And they also obviously wanted more torpedo armament, so the subsequent destroyers had gone with three twin mounts instead of four and in, instead managed to fit in a second set of torpedo tubes now while they were looking at introducing a new type of 4.7 inch mounting that would allow for higher elevation somebody pointed out well the destroyers are edging up a little bit in size displacement uh, etc anyway 
And if we look at things, the new 4.7 inch mount, yes, it offers slightly better anti-aircraft capability than the old one, but it's still not as good an anti-aircraft weapon as the twin 5.25. And, you know, there's barely just over half an inch in it. So why don't we have an intermediate destroyer that's equipped with three twin 5.25 inch mounts in basically the layout that the that the JK LMNNs ended up having anyway. Yeah, we'll have to make it just a fraction larger, but not by much. And the overall specs in terms of number of guns, caliber of guns, size, speed, etc. actually looks very close to the Mogador, the French super destroyer, because, you know, there was a lot of, well, while we're there, um, and the power plant went through the roof as well. As it turned out, sadly for aficionados of destroyers, they did not get constructed. But whilst, yes, a L-class or equivalent, you know, basically a bunch of British super destroyers with 5.25 certainly would have been a lot better at defending themselves from anti-aircraft attack. Overall, it's probably better that they didn't go through with the design purely because there was that huge, huge bottleneck of production on the 5.25-inch gun. So if they had constructed them, then you would have been sitting there with a bunch of destroyer hulls with no actual main armament. Um, although, that said, if you have made the destroyer hull large enough to fit the 5.25 twin, and it's now got this the through deck mount because it was basically just lifting the Dido class mounts off wholesale, then maybe, maybe just maybe, you could have just gone, well, we've got the size, we've got the through deck mounting, we'll just stick some 4.5s on instead, on pancake mounts, and that would have been even better. Chief Eye Roll asks, following up your Je Nicole question in Drydock 214, can you talk about President Thomas Jefferson's home defence gunboat policy and what its assumptions and flaws are like compared to the Je Nicole. Well, whilst the Je Nicole may have been a flawed concept, uh, at least in my opinion, the gunboat policy was, to quote one of the Jurassic Park films, possibly the worst idea in the long sad history of bad ideas when it comes to naval self-defence. Now, this is the gunboat USS Philadelphia, which predates the Jeffersonian policy by about 30 years, but is a good illustration of roughly what he was building. So the gunboats in question, they usually carried either a couple of long guns, or they'd carry one big long gun up front, and a couple of medium-sized guns either side, or occasionally, depending on the gunboat, especially later on, they'd have the big, one big one up front, usually a 32-pounder, sometimes a 24, and then four or five, four, six, nine pounders on the sides. So, yeah, not particularly large, not particularly heavily armed, but could be built in fairly large numbers. Now, Jefferson's idea basically seems to have been predicated around... He had conflicts ongoing with various navies, including... I mean, you had the quasi-war immediately preceding his office, and then at the point that he was in office, you also had tensions with the British Navy, the Royal Navy, and he decided that, well, the US Navy can't possibly hope to match them on the high seas in a straight-out conflict, which was true, but whereas, you know, other presidents looked at it and went, well, therefore we should have a small, high-capacity, or high-capability frigate force, Jefferson just went, well, the best way to not get involved in a war with the British is to not be physically capable of getting involved in a war with the British and therefore to just have hundreds of gunboats al along the US coast. Because these things, as you can probably imagine, are categorically incapable of any kind of significant overseas travel, so the British can't possibly view them as a threat. The only thing these things can do is defend the coastline. Therefore, hopefully, the British will leave us alone. This rather missed two major points. One was it didn't stop the British from going after US commerce, commercial shipping, um, and or impressing people off of the ships, whether they be British citizens, American citizens, or British citizens naturalised to being American citizens, which the British didn't recognise, but that's a whole different discussion. 
in any case, whatever the British were doing to American merchant ships, a gunboat policy would completely allow them to do it because there'd be nothing the Americans could do to stop them. In fact, Jefferson even admitted the gunboats probably couldn't even defend American commercial shipping on America's own coasts. Now, to be fair to him, he did envisage having um, horse artillery batteries, some ships converted to floating batteries for harbour defence and some fixed coastal fortifications to back up the gunboats. But the other major flaw of the plan was that you could build five, six hundred gunboats, but America's a big place, even when it was at this point confined to the east coast and bits of the southern coast. And, yeah, 500 gunboats, each armed with at least a single ship-of-the-line grade cannon might sound impressive, but when you've distributed them across all the American port cities and harbours that will need defending, including inland river and lake flotillas, you suddenly end up with far fewer gunboats. Now, that's not to say that swarming gunboat tactics couldn't be effective in defence. Uh, the Danes we use them to a certain deg degree of effectiveness in the waters between Denmark and Sweden. Uh, the Barbary pirates use them to defend their ports. But generally speaking, their concentration of force over coastline was much, much, much higher than you were going to achieve with anything short of a significant four-figure force of gunboats on the US coast. And with that in mind, if you manage to annoy someone who was, you know, in possession of a large enough navy that they could just show up off the US coast, like Britain or France or Spain, then all they had to do was show up with half a dozen frigates or, you know, two frigates and a ship of the line at one location, and the concentrated firepower of those ships would be vastly in excess of the firepower that the local gunboats could bring to bear. Plus, of course, you know, yeah, even if you have, let's say, two dozen gunboats and a first rate comes along you might think okay well we've got you know two dozen 32 pounders and the, the ship that we're facing doesn't have two dozen 32 pounders on a broadside it has you know three dozen 32 pounders total but they're split between two broadsides so we'll all attack on one side and we've got the superior firepower yeah that'll work for about the first minute because of course a ship of the line is designed to take pounding from ships that are similar to it so you will hit it great it's taken some damage equivalent as i said to being hit by broad by a partial broadside from a peer opponent then it fires back at you how long do you think a ship like this is going to last under that fire by the time of the second broadside you're probably down to half your strength and it very quickly gets worse after that now if the wind dies okay fair enough you are you know have a you're in a much better position but um you're relying on the wind dying to have any form of effective harbor defense so a lot of the assumptions were flawed in and of themselves and the flaws that were just outright flaws let alone flawed assumptions it, it was just a, a generally terrible policy uh, the only thing it really did at least on paper, was cut costs. And even then, it turned out gunboats cost a lot more to run um, than they thought. So that's why it was basically a one-president policy. And the minute that Jefferson was out of office, uh, pretty much all the subsequent successors started revoking that policy and working around to having the US Navy that most people are familiar with from the War of 1812. And it should be noted, on top of that, that... Um, even at the time of the War of 1812, a little bit after gunboats had fallen out of favour, the US still had almost 200 gunboats. But how many of those feature in any kind of successful action by the US Navy as compared to the frigates that the US Navy built? Mike Hall asks, There was a period a hundred or more years ago where army commanders were captivated by the idea of double envelopments and the Battle of Annihilation, possibly due to an overexposure to the Battle of Cannae. Looking at the classic Age of Sail, say from 1700 onwards, many of the actions were indecisive, and even the victories often only amounted to knocking the enemy about a lot while taking a handful of ships. Did navies dream of battles of annihilation, or was it just accepted that a ship of the line so resilient and the manoeuvring control of large fleets so hard that it was not reasonable to expect more than a few captures, especially as damage to rigging and masts would often prevent effective pursuit? Or could a more determined attitude really have 
allowed for the taking of, say, another 20 ships at the Battle of the Saints, as Samuel Hood supposedly claimed. Now, there are quite a number of factors involved. Um, Signalling, as you mentioned, was one of them during a lot of the 1700s. You'd be surprised at just how awful the ability to signal and respond actually was. It wasn't until the end of the 1700s that fully developed signal books of the form that most people are familiar with actually started to come into, into vogue. But there were a few other things. For one, capital ships were some of the most complex and expensive single pieces of kit that any nation had constructed up until that time. So a little bit like say World War One. once you've got this large collection of very, very expensive capital ships, people become suddenly very, very loath to risk them. Um, also, let's face it, most age of sail battles, the speed of maneuvering is not massively great, which means that in a lot of circumstances, your enemy will know what you're trying to do long before you accomplish it. It's not very often that you manage to pull off, at least in a full fleet battle, something that's a complete and utter surprise. I mean, even at Trafalgar, people knew what Nelson was doing. They could see it happening, unfurling in front of their eyes for over half an hour before it actually happened. It's just there wasn't a tremendous amount they could actually do about it other than shoot at people and hope for the best. There were the there was the occasional surprise like the Nile, but that's where people had just made assumptions and in some cases somewhat well founded assumptions about where ships could go. But once it started happening, again, you know, they had ten, fifteen, twenty minutes in some cases to see what was happening and go, Oh, right, well I guess we should be preparing for that. So the speed or lack thereof of battles is certainly a factor. But the other major issue to consider with Age of Sail battles and whether or not they become battles of annihilation is that the point of the line of battle was, yes, to maximise firepower, but also, just as if not more importantly, it was to protect the fleet. It was The line of battle is more of a defensive than an offensive thing. It's very unwieldy, very difficult to manoeuvre. And unless your opponent obliges by also getting into a line, it's actually relatively difficult to bring all of your firepower to bear, at least prior to the invention of the rotating turret. But what it does do very handily is it protects the vulnerable fore and aft of your own ships, and it makes it very difficult for the enemy to isolate one of your ships. And this is one of the major issues, combined with the expense of these ships in the first place, is the fact that If you assume that the crews of each side are, relatively speaking, equal-ish, or at least within shouting distance thereof, a pell-mell Nelsonian-style battle is a massive, massive, massive gamble, because your ship may or may, any given ship from your fleet, this is, may or may not be better or worse than any given ship in the opponent's fleet, But considering that battles involve a mixture of first, second, third, and in the early part of the 1700s, fourth rates, the chances of one of your ships happening to meet its exact or near enough equal or lesser are about as good as it meeting its superior, at which point you're probably going to lose that ship. And in a pell-mell battle, everything's so chaotic and things are relatively slow to respond that you could end up with... You know, one of your ships being double teamed by an enemy format, an enemy pair of ships, and then again, you will probably going to lose that ship. Which means that even if you have numerical superiority, let's say you have 30 ships to the enemy 25, a well handled enemy fleet that you try and get into a melee fight with, especially considering you're the one getting into the melee fight, so they're going to have closer order to start with if they maintain their defensive formation, it's entirely possible that despite having the numerically larger fleet, you might lose the battle because of the details of what's going on on a ship-per-ship basis. You might win overwhelmingly, but you might also lose overwhelmingly, and it's a huge roll of the dice. Now, where Nelson and the Battle of Annihilation and some of the other actions involved come in is not just uh, 
technology advances and tactical advances, it's also a matter of crew. You've got to remember that the Nelsonian-style battle comes around at a time when the Napoleonic era dash revolutionary era French Navy has taken a huge downturn in overall command and seamanship skill, which means that all of a sudden, combined with the fact that the British have, thanks to decades of war, honed their navy to a cutting edge, means that the skill disparity is such that you can actually throw your ships just generally into combat and expect them to handle themselves pretty well against almost anybody. And you see that at Trafalgar, where like 74 gunners, which are third rates, quite happily go up and will ha happily exchange broadsides with the Santissima Trinidad until they're too battered to continue, and then they'll just wander off and find something else to shoot at, and Santissima Trinidad isn't really able to capitalise on the fact it's theoretically beaten off an attack, because it's damaged and it's not exactly the world's best sailor in the first place. And apart from the fact that Spain only enters the this sort of period of war on and off uh, occasionally, as compared to the French, which the British are not quite but almost permanently at war with, and the fact the Fran the Spanish didn't have the same kind of revolution where they you know murdered everybody who happened to have any kind of aristocratic blood in them that they could get their hands on. Um, you'll tend to see that most of the battles of annihilation that are fought in this period tend to be fought against the French or related navies which have had a similar skill level drop. It's actually very, very rare to find a full-scale fleet action against the Spanish navy where a battle of annihilation is considered possible. Now, occasionally with a a good bit of luck and you know, manoeuvring, it might be possible, and the Spanish Navy did have its issues, but broadly speaking, the Spanish were usually slightly tougher opponents than revolutionary-Napoleonic-era French vessels were, which was a slight inversion from the before when the Royal French vessels had been the tougher opponents slightly compared to the Spanish fleet, which was overall, as I said, in something of a decline at this point. So whilst it sounds good, and you know, if you can pull it off in practice, it is good, a battle of annihilation in the Age of Sail depends on a lot of external factors beyond just the willingness and aggression of captains and admirals. It relies on very deep-founded, skill-based um, issues that are only present for transient periods of time. And you know, that's why, outside of massively overwhelming technological and numerical superiority, you don't tend to see quite as many battles of annihilation thereafter. Gregory Albert asks, How much sail would be required to turn the SS Great Eastern into a fast ship? This version of the behemoth being sail-powered only. Well, it's somewhat difficult to say, because the top speed of large sailing ships seems to be, at least for the technology of the period, somewhere in the higher teens, so 17, 18 knots sustained, which isn't a million miles away from, you know, the 12, 13 knots of sailing frigates um, of a slightly earlier period. And Great Eastern's top speed under sails alone is a little bit difficult to track down, but because um, she did, she often operated mostly under steam due to issues with the uh, funnels messing with the sails. But if you assume that she's under sail only, well, that does save a lot of displacement because, you know, massive amounts of coal don't need to be carried. Engines, boilers, um, <laughs> the, the paddle wheels, the screw, all of that can go. So she's going to be uh, riding a little lighter, which is probably good because you're going to have to probably stick a few more cells on. So you can see from the side profile how her uh, rig was laid out. Now, there's immediately, if you remove the funnels, there's space in between what are currently the first and second funnels for another mast to go. And as you can see, the, the central masts, um, masts three and four out of seven, um, are substantially larger. So you could, I guess, probably... If you included in adding one more mast, you could have 
four, maybe probably I'd say to be on the safe side, four, maybe five masts under the full rig of sail that you see with the amidships sails. But um, when you start adding up the total square footage of sail, you suddenly work out that you're you're very, very, very rapidly approaching the total square footage similar to the largest amount of square footage ever put to sea on a single sailing ship. And much like putting 120 aircraft on USS Midway when she was initially launched, it basically, you, you start to hit a ceiling where it's impractical. There's just so many sails and so much rope and going on and so many men going around there there is actually an upper limit beyond which there are there are too many sails and it all becomes unmanageable but if you did that yeah i don't the sheer scale of this thing i i do find it difficult to imagine under sail that she could get up to cutty sark clipper speeds but i, I could possibly see her maybe getting up to 15 knots maybe before you hit a, uh, a point of no return on the sails but um well it would certainly be an interesting experience <laughs> to say the least you'd probably end up having to put a lot of lead in the in in the keel to make stop her rolling over under the force of that much sail camino john asks waltering hms belfast it takes you through the machine shop I believe the importance of this space is lost. However, watching videos from Cutting Edge Engineering brings it to the front and centre. Um, link below. It makes logical sense that it's impossible to carry spare parts for everything, but with proper machines, equipment and stock materials, you can fabricate what's necessary for routine items that break or wear out. Could you answer the following? Um, where did they store the stock materials? Did machine shops on ships within a flotilla squadron or fleet work together to manufacture or fabricate what was necessary, or was it every ship for themselves? And out of all the normal positions on board a ship, was the staff in the machine shop the most like a normal 9 to 5 job? So stock materials would have been held with general stores. So when you look on um, ships' plans, where they're just labelled stores um, or parts as well, that's where you'll generally find stock material. Um, obviously you have ship stores in terms of food, you generally store it with those, and refrigeration, also not there, um, but, you know, you've got paint lockers, you've got material storage, etc. So, unfortunately, they don't kind of say, here is where we store all our blank metal, for example. Um, it will just be, you know, various bits and pieces around that are, happen to be around. Plus, of course, you can recycle and scavenge from other stuff that you've got to hand as well. Um, now and of course you know generally the storerooms tending to be in the, either the deepest parts of the ship or various extremities don't tend to be on the tour route for belfast um now as far as was it every ship for themselves well the, the machine shops aboard the ships were meant to be at le make the ships at least somewhat self-sufficient obviously you can't make yourself entirely self-sufficient there are spare parts that you can't manufacture that you have to use from stocks of spares that you have aboard the ship and some things that just flat out there aren't spares and you can't manufacture um for example uh if let's say a bunch of the bearings or rollers depending on what kind of ship you're on um it, for a turret break for whatever reason um chances are you're probably not carrying two dozen spare uh <laughs> turret rollers and two even if you were um, you don't really have the capability of lifting the turret up to get access to replace them. Um, so yeah, that, at that point you're you're probably stuck unless you can just you could probably drill them out, um, but replacing them is probably not going to be a a thing that you can do. Now, obviously, the machine shop on a destroyer is less capable than something like this, which is the machine shop on Belfast, which is then less capable than the machine shops on battleships and carriers. So whilst you generally would just try and work within your own means, if you're operating as part of a fleet or a flotilla and, you know, a bigger ship than you might be able to make something that you need and you can't make it because you don't have the facilities aboard um, or you don't have the materials or whatever, then you might well request, you know, 
could your machine shop knock this up for us? And they probably would do it. Um, aircraft carriers in particular, at least in the Royal Navy, and I believe to a certain extent in the US Navy, were actually fairly well known as ports of call for escorts in need of manufactured spares. And finally, in terms of the positions, was it a kind of a nine to five? Actually, it was probably about the, the, the least like a nine to five, I would imagine, uh, because you have obviously engineers, machinists, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but the machine shop is going to run on the basis of need. You know, there's plenty of other things to be done, maintenance, um, stuff to do doing the actual machinery spaces themselves, etc., etc. So if spare parts are needed, then someone will, then, you know, people can come along and with the one, people with the relevant qualifications can create stuff. Um, and if you need some uh, some help, you might have someone who's not assigned to the area at all, just drafted in as a pair of spare hands. But of course, if the ship's taken a bunch of combat damage and a ton of stuff is broken or it's been through a severe storm, then the place is going to be absolutely heaving with people trying to manufacture every everything. And you know, those efforts might well go through 24-7 for several days in a packed room, whereas other times, apart from just generally making sure everything's working, a machine shop might not see much human activity at all for several days, if not weeks, depending on you know, what the ship's doing and what needs fixing. Obviously, at sea, it's going to see a lot more activity than if the ship is alongside, where you can just go and get a spare part of almost any description from stores. And one note, um, in the previous question about machine shops, I said I don't think in the machine shops you're going to be heat treating anything that you manufacture as a replacement. And uh, some people who have served in machine shops point, or had relatives that did point out that in fact they did heat treat things. Um, so uh, just a bit of clarification there. What I meant by that in terms of heat treating was I was thinking in terms of things like replacement sheet metal that was being used for armour um, or gun barrels which obviously need to be heat treated as in you know anti-aircraft gun barrels and such like then those wouldn't be heat treated because simply they're just too massive you you probably couldn't even make most of that in in the machine shop and if, even if you could as i said you don't have the you wouldn't have the equipment to be able to heat treat them to the degree where it would be useful or indeed safe i mean certainly if you're going to manufacture a four inch gun barrel in a machine shop well, I'd like to see you do that in Belfast if you're going to replace a gun, you know, a gun barrel from one of its AA guns. And then if you're going to heat treat that with some oil and the blow torches, I definitely wouldn't want to be the one who's firing the blasted thing. But that's what I had in mind. And what I neglected to think about was what you know, a lot of people pointed out, which is actually much smaller things like tools, um, bolts and other smaller bits of um, pieces made of metal that did need heat treating for hardness purposes those could be done with the blow torches and other heating devices they had on board and a bucket of oil or a bucket of water etc so um i apologize for being a little bit too overly general with that when i answered that previously and that brings us to the end of the dried up for this week thank you very much for listening everyone hope you're having a good day whatever day of the week you're listening in on and uh hope to see you again in another video soon bye <laughs>